Most of us take roads for granted. However, in some parts of the world, including northern Canada, the regular road network is limited at best and seasonal ice roads are the next best thing. Every so often, these temporary roads are called winter roads because they usually cut across ice-covered water bodies as well as snow-covered lands. Obviously, the ice sections classify as ice roads, but strictly speaking, the land sections do not. Instead, winter road stakeholders typically refer to the land crossings as portages. Our Google Earth tour will take us to Gordon Lake in the Northwest Territories, which is part of the Tibet to Contvoito Winter Road. This road is vital to the year-round operations of diamond and gold mines that contribute over $1 billion to Canada's economy every single year. The road usually opens to transport traffic in early February and closes in late March. Weather permitting, it carries about 12 trucks per hour, 24 hours per day and 7 days per week. So, get ready to brave the subarctic winter and let's find out how radar remote sensing can inform decisions relating to the management of ice roads. The Tibet to Contvoito Winter Road is named after the lakes that marked its starting point and end point when it was first constructed in 1982. At that time, the road spanned about 500 kilometers, which is equal to the distance between Amsterdam and Paris. In 2009, Lac de Gras became the road's new final destination because the mines located nearby Contvoito Lake had stopped operating. All season roads connect its starting point at Tibet Lake to a traffic dispatch and control center in Yellowknife. By zooming in, we can expose the mines nearby Lac de Gras in the summertime Landsat images that are used in Google Earth. This case study focuses on Gordon Lake and involves a map created from HH, HV and VV polarized radar set 2 images that were acquired on February 12, 2015. Before we dive into the details, I would like to draw your attention to the large overall difference in the appearance of the Radarsat 2 map and the Landsat 8 background. You can see that both reveal the presence of the Tibet to Contvoita Winter Road. However, only the Radarsat 2 map exposes other ice cover variations. The previously noted capacity of radar waves to penetrate solidly frozen ice and overlying snow explains the difference. But in order for this capacity to be truly beneficial, one must be able to understand how the patterns detected relate to ice cover structure. Field observations are the key to developing this understanding. So let's get started. Our first site of interest demonstrates the layout of the winter road and its radar return signal. Each one of the three purplish lines shown marks a different traffic route. This photograph shows the corresponding aerial view. From left to right you see the so-called backup route, express route and primary route. The primary route is the first route constructed and therefore contains the thickest ice. For this reason, all loaded transport trucks, which can weigh as much as 70 tons, are required to travel on this primary route. Empty trucks prefer to use the express route because it allows for much higher speeds. Going back to the radar map, it is obvious from the color of the routes that their backscatter is largely limited to the HH and VV polarization. In case you wonder why, Please bear with me until we reach site 5 for an explanation. I would like to conclude our visit to site 1 by noting that there is no evidence of transport trucks anywhere in these maps or maps corresponding to different dates. This is surprising given the high traffic density and indicates that the radar return signals of trucks are being drowned out by backscatter from the surrounding ice cover. As we move on to Site 2 and Site 3, 
It is evident that their ice covers have different backscattering properties. Like most ice covering Gordon Lake, the ice around Site 2 shows in a black tone. This means that it generates little backscatter in all three polarizations. In contrast, the ice nearby Site 3 displays in a green tone and must therefore produce a relatively high return signal in the HV polarization. This backscatter variance suggests a different in ice cover structure. So, let's look for clues in the available field data. The type of ice found at Site 2 is often referred to as columnar ice, but is also known as thermal ice and black ice. The name black ice makes a lot of sense given its appearance in the left-hand photograph. The picture core demonstrates this ice cover is very pure, or in other words, lacks inclusions that generate backscatter. Accordingly, the roughness of this ice cover's undersurface governs its radar return signal. This type of ice is highly valued for the construction of ice roads because it is very strong and can therefore support heavy loads. The ice cover corresponding to Site 3 has a different look and structure. Given its appearance, it will come as no surprise that this type of ice is often called white ice. The name snow ice is also used and gives away that this ice results from the freezing of snow cover that was flooded by either rainwater or lake water that seeped up through cracks. A high density of small air bubbles causes snow ice to act as a volume scatterer and thus explains its relatively high HV backscatter signal. Compared to black ice, white ice has a roughly 50% lower bearing capacity. It must therefore be twice as thick as black ice to support the same weight. However, in reality, the situation is more complicated because snow ice always forms on top of black ice. The right-hand picture shows the ice cover found at Site 3 to a depth of 40 cm. The upper 10 cm clearly consist of snow ice, while the rest is black ice. By the way, in February 2015, the natural ice thickness across most of Gordon Lake was roughly 90 cm. Sites 4 and 5 coincide with the primary route. The photographs for site 4 reveal a combination of snow ice and columnar ice. Corresponding auger measurements indicate that the total ice thickness was about 1.4 meter, which is 50 centimeters more than the natural ice thickness. Ice road builders boost the growth of ice by keeping the roots free from snow. Similarly, the snow ice layer is the result of repeated flooding by means of pumps and water trucks. Relative to natural snow ice, this man-made snow ice contains much less air bubbles and is therefore stronger. There is no doubt that the thickness of an ice cover governs its capability to bear people and vehicles. The measurement of ice thickness is a hazardous undertaking, especially during early winter, because all conventional methods require access to the ice. A radar remote sensing-based alternative, if reliable, offers several advantages, including a much lower risk to life and property. There are indications in literature that the development of this type of capacity is underway. As you may recall, Site 5 was to provide an explanation for the distinct backscattering behavior of the road routes. So, let's have a look. To begin with, these photographs reveal that the road surface conditions are highly variable. To preserve its integrity and improve its traction, the road is regularly maintained with the help of graders, sanding trucks, watering trucks and snow plows. These operations, combined with traffic tracks and natural ice cover variability, 
create a surface with a complex structural properties. But if not recently flooded, the surface is solidly frozen and should not affect the road's backscatter in a major way. Instead, I believe that cracks such as the one shown in the left-hand photograph introduce a backscatter behavior similar to that of corner reflectors and therefore enhance the road's return in the HH and VV polarization. An analysis of higher resolution images reveals that the adjoining snow banks also produce relatively high HH and VV polarized backscatter signals. Sites 6 and 7 locate towards the northern end of Gordon Lake. Site 6 corresponds to an area of high backscatter in each of the polarizations shown. The left-hand photograph exposes an accumulation of relatively thin ice fragments. What happened at this location is the following. Shortly after freeze-up, the ice cover was broken apart and blown into a pile alongside intact ice by high winds. Next, this pile of ice froze in place and regular thermal ice formed underneath. The jumbled structure of this ice, which includes air voids and water pockets, explains its very high radar return signal. From a trafficability perspective, these ice accumulations are a mixed blessing. The fact that they tend to be thicker than the surrounding ice is an advantage. However, the piled up part is weaker and has an extremely rough surface. As such, it is much more expensive to build a smooth road across this type of ice. The right hand picture shows a large crack that developed on Gordon Lake in a previous year. Like ice accumulations, these cracks appear in a white tone but have a more line-like shape. They compromise the safe passage of traffic because they can trigger more widespread cracking that may then lead to the breakthrough of overpassing vehicles. At the start of the tour, I pointed out that this radar set 2 based map does not show any transport trucks and explained the reason why. Our visit to Site 7 will expose their presence in a surprising way and represents a change of course for this case study because it involves a different satellite mission and radar imaging technique. This map reveals the presence of trucks on Gordon Lake by showing the ice cover height changes that they introduce. Radar images acquired by the German Tandem X mission were processed using differential interferometric techniques to establish this map. Ice road experts have known since long that moving vehicles displace ice cover. However, they have so far lacked the tool to measure such displacement fully, widely and quickly. The key to the utility of Tandem X was its unique capacity to acquire two images no more than 10 seconds apart. Among other things, this map illustrates the effect of speed. Slow moving vehicles create localized ball shaped displacement, whereas fast moving vehicles create widespread wave like displacements. For example, this pattern corresponds to a loaded truck that traveled about 25 kilometers per hour. Two other trucks can be seen to be traveling along at a safe distance. Instead, these wave fields are caused by empty trucks with speeds on the order of 60 kilometers per hour. The arrow marks the location of the wave plotted in this graph. Its maximum amplitude is shown to be about 20 millimeters. Especially in nearshore waters, the development of waves is problematic because they can initiate ice cover failures that may sink vehicles. This risk can be mitigated through strict speed control, careful route planning and other measures. 
The type of map shown can inform decisions relating to the planning and implementation of such measures.